Hello, everyone. Welcome to Del Monte and Science. I'm Lou Del Monte. This is part four. We're discussing the relationship between time, existence, and energy. In our last discussion, in part three, we talked about the Galilean transformation. And what we said was, in the Galilean transformation, which, which is a trans, it, it, when, we, when we say transformation, we're talking about inertial frames of reference. This would be a frame of reference that's moving at a constant velocity. And we're talking about, let's call this frame one. We're talking about how do you transfer from one inertial frame of reference to another that might be moving at a different velocity. Let's call that two and call that one. How do you transfer a coordinate for, uh, at such as time from, from one frame to the other? And in the Galilean transformation, T here, T1, was assumed to be the same here. And that actually proved to be incorrect. Okay, But it was the cornerstone for 400 years now we're talking about the cornerstone of Newtonian mechanics. Isaac Newton lived in the 1600s. He was the greatest scientist of his time, developed the laws of motion, the three, three famous laws of, uh, of motion. And uh, the Galilean transformation was the cornerstone of Newtonian mechanics. However, it proved totally inadequate when we were talking about the theory of relativity, the special theory of relativity. So Einstein had to redevelop what's known as now the Lorenz transformation when you're dealing with frames of motion that are moving at a constant velocity, but the velocities might be different, and they're moving perhaps relatively at a very high velocity, such as uh, close to the speed of light, he came up with the Lorenz transformation. That's spelled, I'm just going to spell it for you so you can look it up if, if you like, L-O-R-E-N-T-Z, the Lorenz transformation. I'm not going to go through all the mathematics of that, but this transformation is what Einstein used uh, to uh, facilitate uh, the transformation of coordinates to different inertial frames of reference uh, for this uh, special theory of relativity. Now, let's circle back with this information. Let's circle back to what is time. Okay. So we're going back to the fundamental question we started with, what is time? And it no longer, no longer can we say that it's simply change, okay? To say, well, time is a measure of change. Remember we talked about an atom that was uh, uh, brought to absolute zero and, and that was a hypothetical thought experiment. And that in that thought experiment, the atom was devoid of all heat energy, so there was no movement. And of course, it does violate several laws that we know of today. But it makes the point that the atom still exists. It doesn't disappear from existence. And that it is moving in time, OK? So to, to really understand what time is, what it means to move in time, we really have to understand the kinetic energy associated with moving in time. Now, let me just help you with that a bit. If I have a mass and it's moving, it has a kinetic energy. And if I want to keep it moving, I have to continually put energy into the mass in order to sustain it 
and to keep it moving. Now, I ask the question, what does, what does it take for a mass? What is the kinetic energy of a mass moving in time? And what I did is I first uh, took the velocity of a mass moving in time. And that's where that coordinate in Minkowski space, ICT, came in. ICT. And when I took that coordinate and I, I did the velocity, I'm going to just now, this is in the appendices of the book. It's, it's in my book, Unraveling the Universes of the Mysteries. It's not in the copy because I do not want to uh, burden the reader with a lot of mathematics and so on. But for those of you that are interested, the velocity was uh, the differential of ICT with regard to time. Where time here is the sequence of events, and this turns out to be IC. That's what that basically turns out to be. And you really don't have to understand all this. I'm just saying that's how, that, how you determine the velocity in the fourth coordinate, movement in time. And then if you take Einstein's uh, kinetic energy equation and you plug in this velocity into that equation, you get a very interesting result. You find out that the kinetic energy for any mass moving in the fourth dimension is equal to minus 0.3 mc squared. And this is what I call in the book the existence equation, and I added the word conjecture. And I added that word for a reason, because I did verify this with the data that was available. Uh, there was uh, particle acceleration data that Bailey and Associates did in 1977 uh, on a muon. A muon is a... Uh, a particle, it's a subatomic particle, it's about 200 times heavier than an electron, and it's electrically charged, and they accelerated it uh, close to the speed of light, and it actually, uh, muon, uh, typically disintegrates very quickly, but actually by accelerating it close to the speed of light, it lived, the life of it was extended almost 30 times. So this, this equation actually explains that. If this is the equation on a per unit time basis that's required for a muon to exist for its one lifetime, if I want it to live 30 lifetimes, then I have to multiply this by 30 times 30. And I did that. I multiplied this times 30. And then I took Bailey's uh, information. And I calculated the uh, kinetic energy that uh, they achieved in the uh, particle accelerator data. And I got a 2% agreement, which is a remarkable agreement. Now, you have to understand Bailey's data was done almost uh, it was in 77, so we're talking almost uh, well over 30 years ago, and uh, it was only good to one point after the decimal point. So it's, it's very hard to get a better agreement than this. But there's a high probability that this equation is correct, and this is the kinetic energy of the mass as it moves in time. Now, I want to point out that the equation is dimensionally uh, correct. This is energy. This portion of it is energy. But what's very unusual is this negative sign. Now, almost everything that we have in uh, our normal three-dimensional space has a positive kinetic energy. This has a negative. And the only thing that 
I'm aware of that has negative kinetic energy are virtual particles. And I talk about that in the book as well. And I actually have a chapter on virtual particles. But virtual particles have negative kinetic energy. And I interpret this to mean this is the energy required of a mass. This is the energy that a mass requires. That's why the negative sign is there, to exist. And I'm going to explore this further with you in our very next post.